was very awful news over the past couple of months. We have had the wholesale slaughter of innocent people and societies. And nobody seems to have any solution. We have seen and graphically displayed before us the immorality of our nations, both ours and the United States. What some people tried to keep hidden had been blasted across our screens. And every little tidbit of filth has been brought out in front of us. It only shows more and more the hopelessness and the helplessness of our society. We've all heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, it wasn't that sin. Their sin was that they were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned about the poor. And we can step back and say, nothing has changed. That our society is just like the ancient societies and all of them down through time we are totally selfish selfish whatever we get for ourselves that's what we want where do we go as Christians to get our minds cleared of all that filth where do we go as God's people to bring out a better culture for this world well, of course, we talk about the Word of God. Last week, Ron talked to us about the armor of God. And he talked about righteousness, the gospel, the faith, salvation, the Bible, and praying. And as we as a church put these on, as we have them as the foundation of our faith, the foundation of all the practice, in this local church then God will be pleased but where do we go Monday Tuesday Wednesday etc where do we go how do we get our minds set upon God well Psalm 145 would give us an idea in fact it gives us the secret to it let's read these scriptures together and because you've been sitting down so long. Let's stand up, shall we? This is Psalm 145. Can we read it together? It's right up here. All your versions. This one is Paul's version, so we'll use this. Let's read it together. I will exalt you, my King, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Thank you. You may be seated. David wrote this psalm, and when the compilers of the book of Psalms put it together, this was the last psalm uh, that David had written. And sometimes we send off love letters or pen the silly things to one another and we hardly even know what we're writing down about. But David put that in a poem and an acrostic poem so that the first verse starts with the letter A and then B and C and D all the way through in the Hebrew alphabet. And the whole thing is about praising God, lifting up our voices and praising the Almighty. In verse 1 it says, I will exalt you, my King, uh, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Sometimes we just go to overcome with the joy of the Lord. Uh, even Scottish people do sometimes. And we are filled with God's blessing and love and 
we're just, we've, something has come to us, we've read the scriptures or somebody has said something to us and it just explodes in our presence and we say, hallelujah. That's what the word praise means at the beginning. But then we get down to verse 10. You have made what you, all you have made will praise you, O Lord, your saints will extol you. That's another Hebrew word called yada. That's deliberate praise. That's get up in the morning, whether you feel like it or not, whatever the night before was like, and praise him, because that's what we should be doing. Yada, I'm going to praise God. Praise, we get our English word price from it. What price will I pay for something? Well, what worth is it? What is it worth to me? Whatever it might be, the car, uh, the breakfast that you go out and, and have. What is the price? A painting, Leonardo's painting uh, sold this week. Not the actor, the, the real Leonardo, okay? $450 million. <laughs> you know what? You could have bought it 30 years ago for $50 because nobody thought it was real. You missed it. You could have retired now with all that money. But Leonardo, when his name was put on it, when they verified it, the price was so high. And it, they thought $100 million. No, it went four times that. Half a billion dollars spent on that particular item. The price was very important. The value. When we purchase something, we brag about it, don't we? I had this. This is the most precious thing to me. That, that uh, uh, car, that um, piece of furniture, whatever. It's so important to me. I, I have a beautiful uh, whatever it might be. When we get married, we say, I'm going to take all of my liberties and all of my a freedom. I'm going to set it aside so I can be free with one other person. What do you do with that person? You prize them. You praise them. We have faults, yes. But the price you pay is that you honor and respect and prize that individual. You praise that person. That's exactly what we should be doing. No put downs, the little jibes back and forth. No, that will ruin any relationship. And so we prize that individual, the one that's precious to us. We prize God. We praise him. We value him. Can you imagine the disciples They had such an emotional ride. They come into Jerusalem with Jesus. They're, they're up there. Everybody's cheering Jesus. Oh, we, we're going to set up the kingdom. Five days later, they crucify him. Could you imagine the emotion as, as they crucify Jesus? As they put him on the cross? As he died? They couldn't understand it. They all left and then three days later, he's alive. No, he's not alive. Yes, he is. And he appears before them. The euphoria. And then while he's talking to them, he says, I'm going to leave you. What? You just got back. No, I'm going to leave you so someone better f suited for it will be the one who comes. He'll be with you wherever you go. Not just in one place. And then he goes back to heaven. He ascends up into heaven. What did the disciples do? Were they crushed? No. They went back into the city of Jerusalem, to the temple, and praised God. He's not there. He was, he was here. He's gone back. Why did they praise him? Because they praised who he is. All of his attributes, his qualities. He, they praised him for that. You're alive forevermore. You've taken away our sins. And so they could just got overjoyed and they praised God. 
Peter, I want you to go down to a home of a Gentile. I've never done that before. Doesn't matter, I want you to go there. He goes there and he begins to preach. And he tells them about Jesus. He tells them things like this. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. It'll be all into God's kingdom. And then what happens? While he's preaching, the Holy Spirit comes on and they get saved. They're jumping around. I, I guess the Holy Spirit isn't here this morning, but well, they're jumping around. They're so excited that God has saved them. And what do they do? They speak in other tongues, other languages, and then what do they do? They praise God. My sins are gone. Oh, how wonderful. And Peter said, wow, this is fabulous. This is great. Then he goes back to Jerusalem, and there's some people there. You know what they're like. You went into the house of a Gentile. How dare you do that? No, no, it was okay. God told me to do that. Oh, sure he did. Tell us what happened. Well, what happened was this. I was preaching and people got saved. What did they do then? These hard-hearted Jewish believers praised God. God saves the Gentiles. Aren't you happy about that? <laughs> yes. Jews and Gentiles, I came to save everybody, said Jesus. And that message goes out throughout the whole world. What did they do? They praised God. Not for what he did, but for who he is. Who he is. Praise is the mark of a Christian. Mark of a Christian. Here is the, the magnitude of, of creation. The almighty God. Uh, Everett mentioned it, was mentioned earlier. We sang about it. The Almighty God. These are the pictures that come from the Hubble telescope, which we've never seen before. They're way out there hidden. And, and it's amazing. And all of these qualities of God, there he is. And we can praise God for all the heavens because he put them in place. Now you can stand back and say, it's... Earth is the only inhabited planet in the entire universe. Wow. Just think about that. In verse 5 it says, They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. To see the magnificence of heaven. Uh, we were in Victoria a long time ago, and there's an observatory over there, and so we went one, uh, one clear night. The moon was absolutely beautiful. So we went, went around this room and everybody said, oh, this is what we're going to look at. Uh, the whatever for wherever. It's so many million light years away. And we're going to look at that. And so we got up there. Mm -hmm. huh? It was like six or seven grains of salt on a piece of black paper. I was so impressed. The moon was out there. Why didn't we look at the moon? They didn't look at the moon. They looked at something. I don't even know what it was. But we were impressed. The God's works. Do, or do we stand out there sometimes and say, Oh, God, what a magnificent array of stars that are out here. We all go out to the country. And one of the things is get away from the city so we can see the stars. Do we thank God for those? And to see the, the magnificence of God in creation. And, and to just understand that the millions of light years out there, God put them all in space. We talked about the moon. Everett was talking about the moon. And sometimes we see them. Did you know that in January we have a blue moon? Yes, January the 1st, the full moon, and the 31st, the full moon. It's, you know that ahead of time. And sometimes the moon is just be beautiful and brilliant out there. And, uh, oh, sorry, I got that. That's mixed up there. The magnificence. But what else do we see out there in space? Well, here's something that they found is a smiley face. And it's out there somewhere, I don't, I don't know where it is, the magnificence of God, and he just 
put these stars in place. The creator God did all of that. But then we say, well, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have a telescope, I don't get out of town too much, and I look up sometimes, it's all nice, I'm not really worried about that. What about flowers? What about flowers? Georgia O'Keeffe painted many flowers, and she painted them because she says, you know, we look at them, we don't see them. We pass by. Somebody gives you even these artificial flowers, you don't even look at them, it's sort of an array of things. But do we actually look right at the flower? So she said, I, I want people to look at them. So she got these big canvases and she began to paint. And she began to paint these flowers so that people actually stop and look at them. You can do that today. You can go to a store, buy a flower, and examine it. How beautiful, how beautiful her, her works. And just to stop and see the magnitude of God little things. Our grandson was at the science fair this, this past week, Science World. And he came home and said, Grandpa, I, I saw the thing that's bugging you. I said, what exactly is that? He said, we watched it under a microscope. What was that? The chafer beetle. I said, did you kill it? No, no, Grandpa, I didn't kill it. But they, were saw, they saw this little thing, and of course it's made so much bigger. The little things. I think it was Janu that told us years ago, before she became a Christian, she would look at the, the plants and she said, there's got to be some creator here. And God says, yes, it's me. It's me. The almighty God. The almighty God. And you can say this, that the governor general is wrong. Jesus Christ did create the things of this world. It's not by chance. It's by God. In verse 4, one generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. Of course. You pass it on. You pass on something to people. If it's your children, that's one thing. If it's your family, that's another thing. If it's your workmates or friends, you pass on what you believe. Deuteronomy 6 says the whole orb of your life is to be revol revolving around God. Family came home from church one time. Not here, you don't know them. Okay, good, got that. Came home from church and one of the children says, why do we go to church? And so the parents said, well, we go to church because, well, it's, listen to the... Uh, Sermon. We sing songs of praise to God. We, we meet with other Christians. We just get encouraged in our heart. Yeah, but why do we go to church? Hmm. Well, the parents went through the whole thing again. No, why do we go to church? Finally, they said, what do you mean? Why do we go to church when the rest of the week we do whatever we want? Hmm. And so the, church, the, the, the family stopped going to church. How tragic. How tragic. God Almighty wants to influence every part of our life. You know, youth, uh, whether it's teens, college and careers, or even younger kids, <clears throat> in the United States, as, as in Canada, kids get to a certain age, mid-teens, whatever, they leave the church. United States, the most wonderful thing is they come back to the church. You know, in Canada, they don't. They leave the church. That's it. I'm done. Finished. I'm, I'm out of here. And, and part of the reason why they give up on Christianity and give up on church, if I want to put it that way, is this. They want to find out if church is real. Is Christ real? Does he make any difference in our life? Or is it just through the motion? Do we just come here, nice little time, then go home? Is that all it means? Or is there some reality in our faith, a growingness in our faith? 
that we hang on to, we praise the almighty God because of who he is, who he is, and, and enjoy his presence every day. Ah, shall we say this again? Yes. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. He's not only the almighty God, he's the compassionate God. He, he says in the Old Testament, when, when he was discussing with Israel, he said, figuratively, I found you in a field. You had just been born. You were kicking around in your blood with all the, the clothes on you, the, the blood and all that mess. Just don't go any further. I found you. And I rushed over. And I cleaned you up. I cleaned you up. I made you a precious baby. What to hold a baby in our arms. And I held you close to my arms. And when you grew older, and I had given to you absolutely everything, what happened? I married you. I brought you into my intimate relationship. I married you. But you wouldn't have any part of it. You ran off. You committed the ultimate adultery. You left God. And away you went. And yet, in your ruined state, I went after you and brought you back to myself again and again. And now, Israel's in a state of running away from God again. One day, finally, going to bring them back to himself. We're all there, aren't we? And we have those days when we just walk away from God and say, I'm tired of it. And God searches out and brings us back to himself. He is the compassionate God. You see verse 8, we sang about it this morning. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. Boy, do I love that verse. <laughs> do I love that verse, slow to anger. Boy, oh boy, compassionate. And God, he loves. He loves. And he wants us to come around him and appreciate him and, and to just understand his love, to praise him for it. You know, you, uh, a week ago, you put together the shoe boxes and you showed your love to somebody you'll never see again. Maybe somebody will come here and say, you remember that shoe box? Well, I, I opened that shoe box and I found the word of God there. I had some toys, but I accepted Jesus. We prayed over them. Because they're not just shoe boxes. They're, they're a, a gospel message around the world. And some people just don't get it. It was last Christmas, before Christmas, where they were recounting uh, shoe boxes being made in, I think it was Nova Scotia. And I'm thinking, this sounds suspect like the Samaritan's Purse thing. I, I wonder if it is. Well, they never said anything about it. But just at the very end, a truck drove by with Samaritan's Purse on the logo, uh, on, uh, on the uh, driver's door. And I thought, oh, why didn't they mention that? That Christians are giving of their time and of their money to send a gospel message somewhere in the world. The news media didn't get it. You got it. You got it. And, and your compassion is God's compassion. <laughs> Our daughter Jody was in Africa, and she said she walking down the street in the village one time, and there was all these shoeboxes piled there, and you could buy them. Some people take advantage of it, yes. But how wonderful it is when... Um, you give them away. Verse 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. 
God is a compassionate God. God is the, the almighty God, the creator. And what does he do? Why, simply, he makes sure that fall and then winter and then spring and then summer. And you can count on it. I don't know if you got your winter tires on too bad because you have to wait. I've got ours. We've got ours on. Yes, that's good. Some of you nodding. Some of you saying, oh, please. Is there going to be a lot of snow this winter? Some people say yes. Is there going to be a little snow? Well, some people say yes. But you know it's coming, winter. Because that's the way God has orchestrated the entire universe, especially our earth. Everything follows off. What a compassionate God. He doesn't pull any surprises. And it doesn't matter about global warming and all that. He'll take care of all that. He is the almighty God. He's also a compassionate God and reaching down to save us. He's also, also, also the righteous God. See verse 20? The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Oh, how do we get those two things together? Loving some and destroying others. When I get angry, and some of you have known it, uh, I get very angry and up and down and maybe I have to apologize. God's anger and God's wrath against sin is quite different. It's very steady. It's very steady. And he doesn't get emotionally up and down about it. He just says, this is my plan. I have offered the world this. And when they refuse, I'll deal with them. How awful is this? He watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. And God doesn't deal with sin, or, or doesn't act with sin. I do when I blow off steam, when I just get violent in my emotions. So do you. But God doesn't. It's righteous anger. His wrath is righteous. And God will deal with everything in a proper manner. But just think of the love of God. See, here we were over here, every last one of us, without any kind of hope, without any kind of way of even reaching out to God. We were all here. God, through Jesus Christ, reached down and he selected a whole pile of people to be his and he gathered us back on this side of the cross of Calvary and he made sure that we're eternally secure. We didn't have any hope and yet God showed his love to us. We're, we're secure. Are you saved today? Then you can praise today. Praise God Almighty not because he saved you, but praise him for who he is. He is the almighty God, the compassionate God, yes, and even the righteous God. I have brothers who are not saved. I have friends who are not saved. I have neighbors who are not saved. And what is most important is that I care enough about them to give them the, the message of salvation. Let's say it again. Let's stand up and just say it again. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Thank you. You may be seated. To praise God. To value him. To put the price on him. And then to act accordingly. But there's a limit to praise. There's a limitation in praise. It's found in verse 2. Every day I will praise you. 
Uh, you don't need to wait till camp and say, well, I'll praise God for all the things up there. Don't have to wait till tomorrow. Don't have to wait for next Sunday. Don't have to wait for Christmas. Every day we praise God. Not for what he's done for us, but who he is. Who he is. And then there's a limitless to it. And he says, I will extol your name forever and ever. When you go to the book of Isaiah chapter 6, the great beast surrounding the throne say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And you probably say, well, you know, maybe after 10,000 years I'll get a little tired of praising God. I don't think so. Because those beasts see a new depth, new quality of holiness in God. And they just have to say it holy. Did you see that? Wow, that's wonderful. God is so holy. And so they praise God. And every time we see uh, the beauty of God in this world and in our lives and out of the scriptures, we should be praising him. You know, we go to a prayer meetings. We take along our prayer sheet, prayer list. Maybe every morning you get your prayer list there. What would it be like if you had your prayer list, you came to the prayer meeting, and everybody else came with their prayer list. We all put it together, and nobody prayed about a thing. Just praised God. You know what? That'd be a good prayer meeting. Instead of just praying, these are the things we need, these are the things we want. Turn it around and just, with great joy, praise Almighty God. What is he worth? Then that indeed is what I need to give back to him. We're going to sing a song in closing. Number 40. Number 40. Joachim Neander. 20 years old. Never had a care about God in the world. Got saved. Four years later, <clears throat> he was a choir director at a big university in Germany. <laughs> they thought so much of him, they fired him. You know why? Because he was too evangelical. Imagine going to a church and, and you're praising God too much. Well, he got fired from that. He wandered around in Germany for a few years and died at the age of 30. Yet he gave us this hymn. Let's stand. Let's praise Almighty God. <laughs>